Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking our first look at Total War Saga Troy, the next Saga title coming out set during the Trojan War, bringing the Total War games to a completely different era, further back in time than it's ever been before. I have two videos coming out today about Total War Saga Troy, and if you want to watch some intense battle gameplay and hear my in-depth impressions from this opportunity to play, check out the other video I've linked in the description and pinned comment down below. You can also find it under the eye at the top right corner of the screen. In this video, I want to touch on some of the major new, upgraded, or evolved features coming in Total War Saga Troy. Some are confirmations of old features making a return, and some are brand new features or changes to mechanics that we're seeing for the first time in Troy. Lots of exciting stuff to talk about, so without any more time to waste, let's dive in. Full multi-tier siege battles. While the battle we fought took place outside of Troy, with Hector leading an army sallying out of the city, the map itself did include the city of Troy behind it, and a later interview with the developers gave us some extra insight into how sieges will work in Troy. For one, the city layout you see here is accurate to a potential siege battle in the game. I don't know what tier Troy is at in this particular map, but you can see how there are multiple points of entry, multiple layers of defense, and a fair bit of vertical difference across the city as well. These are all things that we'll be seeing in more places than just Troy. Not only are all siege battles going to be full 360 degree siege battles, but they're also going to feature variants in height and urban layouts to really push how interesting the siege fighting is going to be. And we'll sometimes see a second layer of defense, meaning more multi-tier siege battles than just Troy. An interesting note is that the AI for these battles is actually the Three Kingdoms AI, but it's been trained further to improve over the performance there. And the reason why I bring all this up is because as a reminder, Troy is built off the Total War Warhammer engine version, and I wanted to set aside concerns about siege battles. This is also interesting to note for siege battles in Warhammer 3, but that's a conversation for later. In Troy, siege equipment isn't really a thing. They weren't really a thing in the era, giant wooden horses notwithstanding, so siege battles will be different from the usual recipe on that front as well. We haven't had personal experience with it, so I don't want to comment on it too much further. One final thing to note though, is that for minor settlements, we're going to see siege battles vary from open field battles with minor settlements at their lowest tier, to proper walled settlement fighting when fully upgraded. Epic Heroes, Heroes, and Agents Something we've already heard a little bit about is the presence of the hero type and mythical type units. Heroes will be like in Warhammer or Romance Mode of Three Kingdoms. These are super fighters with special abilities, fighting as single entity units, providing all the standard trappings of a Total War General unit otherwise. We were able to see Achilles and Hector in action, the epic heroes for Phythia and Troy respectively, and the game will feature four categories of these epic heroes. Fighters, Defenders, Warlords, and Archers. They're all pretty self-explanatory in name, I think, but Warlords are the only one that are a little different, focused on particularly good campaign buffs rather than battlefield support. Paired with these epic heroes are heroes, and while we see the same four classes, we're going to see 11 subclasses. These subclasses will each have their own skill trees, and though some skills will be shared between them, the branches and paths that connect them will be different, allowing some things to be unlocked earlier or later on the campaign map as you rank up your heroes. One can assume that heroes are the equivalent of regular generals leading other armies that your epic hero is not leading himself. While I have no footage to share about them, I can also confirm the existence of agents in the game, and though they can be embedded into armies for various effects, they won't be showing up on the battlefield because of their roles, their priestesses or envoys, things like that. Not really fighter characters, but I suspect they'll still have battlefield effects. But again, there's no room for speculation here. Just wanted to mention that agents on the campaign map are confirmed, they can be embedded in armies, however, they don't show up on the battlefield. Duels are back. Sort of. 
While in Three Kingdoms, duels work as two individuals calling each other out, here in Troy, anytime two heroes fight, they will duel with synced animations. And while these duels can result in the death of one hero, they can be interrupted at any time with a simple command to move away or attack elsewhere, like disengaging a regular unit. So, these duels are only duels in animation. With that said, there's an ability we saw on Achilles that allows him to issue a divine challenge to an enemy hero, forcing them to stay engaged for a short duration, a move that can result in a quick end to the opposing hero's life. Now these heroes are generals on the battlefield, so these deaths come with the implications of morale damage, of course, and I can't end this point without reminding you that again, this is based off the Warhammer engine variant, meaning we're seeing a few Three Kingdoms mechanics getting retroactively implemented here and being iterated on. So what this means for Warhammer 3? I don't know. It's a conversation for later, but I will say I like this implementation of duels a fair bit better than the implementation in Three Kingdoms because it felt more like a battle where these heroes happen to collide rather than some gentleman's agreement or like a Hollywood moment. Mythical Units when it comes to mythical units, we're seeing the whole truth behind the myth thing that we've heard of before. So, minotaurs are actually really tall warriors decked out in skull helms, and centaurs are horseback riders coming in melee, javelin, and bow variants. We've also seen in a blog post separately, uh, giants and cyclopses, and honestly, the way these mythical units are being implemented really changes how fantastical the game feels. They're going to be available similar to mercenary units, with universal recruitment availability as far as factions are concerned, so no matter which faction you're playing as, you'll have access to them, but they'll only be available at certain provinces, and some of them will require you to have favor with particular gods in the form of their divine will. They'll also come with limits in the campaign, so you can only have so many at a time. For example, you can only have one Minotaur across the campaign at any given time, and you can only recruit them if you've got the full support of Zeus. Some of these mythical units will come with their own abilities, like the Minotaur's Roar that hurts enemy morale in a radius, or its Bull Rush that increases mass, allowing it to charge through lines. Others are more akin to regular units, like the Centaurs you see here. They're just melee cavalry. We'll see how the other units behave, but now we know that these mythical units are recruited based on local provinces similar to mercenaries for special recruitment, and their presence is limited in campaign. Now all this certainly makes Troy feel a little less fantastical, which in my books is a step in the right direction, but I'm curious to know what you think. So please let me know in the comments, because this is really one of those you know, bones of contention as it were. There's a lot of opinions about this whole truth behind the uh, myth thing that again, I'm very curious about, I'm very intrigued by, but I understand why some folks are really turned off by it. Magic abilities. Hate it or love it, magic is in the game, though it might go by a different name or two. Rage is the equivalent to mana or the winds of magic in Troy, with rage increasing either by fighting in battle or by using abilities or simply being on the battlefield, depending on your hero. As this bar fills, different abilities become available, each costing a different amount of rage to execute, and each with a different cooldown. These abilities range from being able to buff your own melee stats, to providing morale or other support buffs to the hero or a specific unit, or causing morale damage to an enemy unit. Think of it like magical abilities from Warhammer. There's even one ability that Hector has that just straight up heals units within a radius. Now, meanwhile, Aristea, which I apologize if I'm butchering the pronunciation of, uh, is a bar that fills over time as rage abilities get used up. It's pretty cool. Uh, in Greek epic poetry, Aristea is a moment in which a hero has their kind of finest moment. And I just thought it was neat that they tried to integrate that into the game. Uh, it's kind of magical. It acts as a limited time buff that can only be used once, so it's a little different from the rage abilities that are on cooldown timers and can be used multiple times. And it can make quite an impact on the battlefield, so it certainly lives up to its name and further plays into the idea of the truth behind the myth. Now, these abilities really play into make or break moments on the battlefield, so I definitely have some thoughts to share on it, but again, I'm leaving my opinions for my other video 
that you'll find linked in the description and pinned comment down below. Vehicle damage. Now this is a completely new feature in Troy, and though we didn't get to see it in action in the gameplay, we got to talk to the developers later and they confirmed that heroes will have the option to be atop chariots, and when they ride these chariots into battle, a separate health bar will give us indication of how that chariot is doing, separate from the rider. When the vehicle health hits zero, the rider falls off, takes some damage, but continues fighting on foot. This is absolutely huge, not just for our hero characters in Troy, but think about Lords in Warhammer. Again, it's running on that same engine, except obviously, you know, souped up with a lot of work done. And, and think about cavalry in Total War games in general. Are we maybe going to see an era of cavalry where unmounted warriors continue to fight on foot, albeit less efficiently? This is a short point because, again, we didn't get to see it in action or anything, but it's a point with massive potential implications. New Terrain Types The battlefield upon which an engagement takes place was, is, and will always be a massive factor. The hot gates of Thermopylae, the dense forests of Teutoburg Forest, the muddy soil of Agincourt, there are examples throughout history of it, and while Total War games have previously represented these to a degree, Troy is looking to push that envelope a little further. Apart from the standard terrain-related modifiers of high ground advantages and forests for hiding in, Troy is introducing tall grass, mud, and sand. Sand has a minor effect on the movement speed of units, while mud has a significant impact on turn, movement, and charge speeds, and tall grass is not only a viable hiding spot for lighter units, but is also a speed deterrent for others. This all factors into the pace of battle, and how you'll want to use your units. Some have an easier time traversing certain terrain types than others, and the developers are ensuring that these play a major role in the tactical decision making on the battlefield. In the battle we were able to play, I was able to use the tall grass to good effect, and the mud on the battlefield helped a bit too, but I kept my distance from it because of the approach I was taking on either side of the field. Now, while these aren't entirely new, again, trees reducing cavalry effectiveness has been around for a while, these are adding more layers of complexity to keep things fresh, where there might otherwise be some concern of staleness or sameness. The AI's use of the new terrain types alongside the options they present are very helpful in making the infantry-focused battles feel varied. And yes, there are chariots and cavalry units, but this is an era with one major risk as far as a Total War game is concerned, and that is what I want to cover in this next point. Infantry-focused combat. This is the era of infantry. Swords, spears, axes, shields, but all of it mostly carried on foot. One of my biggest concerns going in was how exactly this would impact the variety on the battlefield, and there are a few seemingly small things that the devs are doing that come together to make quite a large impact. So I've grouped them together under one heading because I feel, again, they all work together towards building a better infantry-focused game. Keep in mind that everything I mention here can apply to other unit types as well, but that's just icing on top. Unit weight seems to have a fairly massive impact. Pardon the pun. While unit mass has always been part of figuring out damage dealt by a charge, we're now seeing how that mass would cause a unit trouble or help a unit on the battlefield. While it often translates into stats, which is to say lighter units are faster but have less armor as an easy example, there's more going on behind the scenes. A good example is that light units suffer a smaller penalty when crossing through terrain types compared to medium or heavy units. While it might seem marginal in this example you're seeing here, it furthers the importance of positioning, using the terrain and the weight of your units to your advantage to open up flanking attacks or to harass while falling back through difficult terrain. On the topic of flanking, flanking has been given a lot more weight. Some units now have traits that either cause a bigger impact from flanking, reduce the impacts of being flanked, or provide an immunity to flanking entirely. The importance of this was on display with the battle as Achilles on hard. I had two non-cheesy victories, playing what was a very challenging battle. Both of these results involved the use of flanking tactics, but one involved the proper implementation of these flanker bonus traits and paying attention to flanking immunity. And that's not all. Greater shield efficiency is absolutely huge on the battlefield. 
The impact of having a shield varied depending on the unit, of course, but by and large, shields seemed a lot more effective at catching arrows for certain units. There were some really efficient shields, and shield efficiency was greatly varied as well. In some cases, we'd see, you know, the average kind of 60%, but in other cases, units had 80% block chances, and that's absolutely massive. You can do very little damage trying to get through that. Now, this meant that target selection made a huge impact, and when melee began, sending your ranged units to flank the heavily shielded ones made an absolutely massive difference, especially since these heavily shielded units are often the more threatening ones as well. Now, this again isn't new to Troy. Shield block chances have been around for a while, but it definitely feels like it's been pushed a lot further than in previous games. Now, it's possible it just feels this way because of how hard the battle was stacked against the player, but as somebody who often takes tier 1 units into final battles, it certainly felt more important here than in any other of the current Total War games. And as far as shields are concerned, some can be put away using alternative modes for certain units as well. Not available to every unit, but some units are able to sacrifice the protection from their shields, replacing it with a higher speed and better attack stats, and activating a new trait that transparently says there is a different advantage from having the shield on the back. Transparency itself is another big feature, I suppose we could call it, with attack intervals and more detail being clearly given to the player. And finally, the introduction of additional unit versus unit buffs is huge. We've had anti-large units before, sure, and we've always had attack intervals determine how some melee units are better than others simply by virtue of striking faster and having a higher DPS. Now, though, we're seeing anti-unit buffs taken to another level, from anti-hero to anti-axe to anti-sword, in addition to anti-large. This is yet another thing that enforces the importance of picking the right unit for the right job. These features are, again, individually small perhaps, but together they made quite a difference on the battlefield and ensured that our mostly infantry battles were interesting as we took Total War Saga Troy battles for our first spin. There are other interesting things going on in the game, like how ambush battles are in, unlike Thrones of Britannia, or the clever use of the term Cadmian Victory rather than Pyrrhic Victory, uh, considering the namesake of the latter didn't exist until many years in the future. A Cadmian Victory is a victory that involves one's own ruin. It's derived from Cadmus, the legendary founder of Thebes in Boeotia, he won a battle against a dragon, but in the process lost all of his companions. Now, if you want to see two of my Cadmian victories that show most of these features in action, check out the links below. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope it gave you some insight into what Troy is doing that might help it stand out from the crowd, and what helps it stand alongside mainline Total War games as well. Are there any particular features that have caught your eye? Is there anything you're particularly impressed or worried by? Do you have any questions? As always, let me know down below and I'll try and answer whatever I can with the knowledge I have. Plus, when you ask questions and reveal your curiosity to me in the comments, I know what you're looking for so that the next time I'm covering Troy, I know what to try and cover. Of course, if you're looking for more coverage of Total War and other strategy games, make sure you subscribe to this channel, as that's the core of what we do around these parts. As always, a massive thanks goes out to all of my channel members and patrons for supporting the channel on a monthly basis. You keep us alive and running smoothly. And as always, a massive thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time. Cheers.